Think of the most iconic cars that come out of Toyota in recent years. The Toyota FT1 concept, the FT Cruiser, and the Lexus LC500 might come to mind. These cars, as well as many others, were the handiwork of a single studio. Quality Design and Research is Toyota's design center in Newport Beach, California, and it's been spearheading the look of the company since its inception in 1973. In this video, we'll discuss the history, significance, and cards of Toyota's West Coast design studio. Quality's origins actually started in the 1960s. Toyota was in the middle of a push into the American market. They sold the Land Cruiser and recently introduced the Tiara, but they weren't able to make any real headway there. The reason for this, they figured, was because their cars were designed in Japan, for Japan, and therefore had limited appeal elsewhere. Toyota made an effort to familiarize themselves with the market. They sent their own designers out to Art Center College of Design for training, and in 1964, brought Stroth and McMahon up to Japan to provide hand-on training. He was an instructor at the school, and they hoped that with his guidance, their future products would be more suited toward American tastes. McMahon thought differently. He felt that the only way for them to know what people there wanted and needed was for their employees to experience day-to-day -day life there on their own. Toyota took his advice and established Culty in 1973. Why Culty? Why not Toyota Advanced Design and Research or something? Well, it was established at a time when Japanese cars weren't as widely accepted as they are now. They feared that there could be some resistance if they stamped Toyota out of the front of the building. So they went with Culty, a magical Toyota in California. What went on there wasn't known to anyone outside of the company. The employees could tell anyone what they did, and they weren't even allowed to have business cards. The locals had no idea what was going on in there. Some thought it was a teacher's factory. Others thought something more nefarious was going on. If you were actually curious enough to go inside, then you'd be greeted by a receptionist, whose sole job was to frustrate you until you left. If you asked what went on there, they said they made culties. If you asked what the heck a culty was, they'd say, you know, the culty. Haven't you seen them around? And that's pretty much what the dialect tree ended. They'd repeat that line if you kept asking, until you gave up and left. Their first workspace was a far cry from the sprawling 85,000 square foot campus they call home today. They first set up shop in a warehouse in El Segundo, near the Los Angeles airport. The studio only employed 6 designers and 25 people in total. This held in comparison to the armies and other manufacturers put out. Ford, for example, had 100 designers and an additional 300 modelers. Despite their small operations, they were already blazing a trail that other automakers would soon follow. Southern California is an automotive design haven. Art Center in Pasadena is one of the world's premier styling institutions, and no fewer than a dozen studios held by major OEMs later to the landscape. It wasn't so long ago that there weren't any design centers in this part of the country. Graduates from Art Center had to take their talents to Detroit, Europe, or Japan if they were set up working for a manufacturer, or joined the local hot riding center if they wanted to stay close to home. This was the perfect location for Toyota. It was relatively close to Japan, they were right in the middle of the largest market, and the favorable weather gave them an upper hand on other companies when they were recruiting talent. Their first product to see a lot of day was the Cal 1 concept, which was shown at the 1977 Tokyo Motor Show and 1978 Frankfurt Motor Show. The coastal setting definitely rubbed off on them. This wood panel section could be removed entirely to reveal a cargo area. More interestingly, the upper portion has a pair of seats. The back window can be lifted up to serve as a window deflector for passengers back here. The Cal 1 never saw production, but the front end proved to look of the Celica Supra. A year later, they worked on the CX-80, the city car of the future. Its lightweight construction and compact dimensions aided fuel economy, while the front wheel drive setup helped it maximize the usable interior space. The thin window just below the greenhouse gave its occupants improved sight lines. After dipping their toes in the water with a few concept cars, Toyota assigned design work of the second generation Celica to the studio. The outgoing model was originally released in 1970 and was a strong seller out the gate. Consumer taste had taken a shift to do in large part of the 1974 oil crisis. Toyota kept updating the car to keep it fresh, but it was clear that it had to be replaced with something designed in the new automotive world. The car was designed by David Stollery. If you're a hardcore Disney buff, then that name might sound familiar. That's because he started on Spin and Marty, a segment of the long-running Mickey Mouse Club television series. He began adding at the age of six, and was 14 when he reprised the role of Marty in the show in 1955. The program was extremely popular, but Stollery retired from acting to pursue his true passion, automotive design. He enrolled at Art Center and went to work for GM after graduating in 1964. In 1974, he was hired by Toyota to help set up the Culty studio. He became a manager afterward, and one of the first products he oversaw was at Celica. The car was shipped in the wind tunnel to make the most of every drop of gasoline. 
it had the same wheelbase as the previous model, but the 1978 Celica was 3.5 inches longer and just under an inch wider. It also became a true 5 seater and lost 135 pounds in the process. The car won over critics. It was Motor Trend's 1978 import car of the year. It beat out the Audi 5000, Ford Fiesta, and Volkswagen Rabbit for the honor. It was also a hit in dealerships. 167,000 of them were sold in the first year on sale, and over 400,000 of them were bought by 1982. It was clear, Calty was here to stay. Now that the program had proven itself to be more than an experiment, the designers needed something more permanent than their El Taguna warehouse. In 1978, they relocated to a large facility in Newport Beach. It was around this time that other companies took notice of Calty. Honda actually wasn't too far behind when they established their R&D center in Taurus in 1975. In a 1982 interview with the New York Times, Calty designer James Sherburn went to the pros and cons of working at the Southern California Satellite Studio. Sherburn worked at Ford for 15 years before coming to Toyota. And one of the main advantages of Calty was how much creative freedom designers had. He said, in Detroit, you have to answer to innumerable layers of management. You can't make a pure design statement. Studio chief Momori Yaigashi added to this, saying, In California, people are free. It is more acceptable to do different things. It is a white canvas. Detroit is a painted canvas. Designed veterans with the Southland to escape the brutal Detroit winter. We've already talked about David Stollery. David Hackett worked for Ford for 15 years before going to Calty in 1978. Dennis Campbell left Chrysler in 1980 and spent 25 years at the firm. Then General Motors Vice President of Design, Irvin Rabicki, said he had trouble hiring young designers that would rather live in California. The Big Three eventually widened up and opened facilities of their own in the region. GM and Chrysler both set up shop there in 1983, and Ford followed them in 84. Being so far removed from the main company loosened the proverbial chains, but it also had its downsides. Studios established by foreign companies back then were mostly responsible for concept development and market research, and were not as well equipped to handle production car development. The lack of oversight also made keeping in touch with HQ more challenging. Executives only made a few trips across the Pacific a year to touch base, and the studio had to go to the hassle of transporting proposals from California to Japan. There was also at times a disconnect between the two cultures. In the interview, Sherburn went on to say, American is designed for a strong graphic image because this is a country with big spaces. It's very tight in Japan and more urban, so they pay more attention to design details. A design that looks fine here can seem out of proportion in Japan. Nevertheless, the firm continued to work on both concept and production cars in the ensuing years. At the 1985 Tokyo Motor Show, the company unveiled the FX5 concept. They call it the performance sedan from the 90s. This is especially reflective in its styling. It's got the wedge profile that many other cars back then had, but the round of servicing shows that it had an eye towards a new decade. The car had the bleeding edge tech of the day, including four-wheel steering and the mid-mounted engine that was both supercharged and turbocharged. This is the first project that Kevin Hunter worked on. It seemed inevitable that he worked for one of the big three. He's a Detroit native and even graduated from the city's esteemed College of Creative Studies. Instead, he made the trip down to Southern California to work for Calty in 1982. He began as a designer, but climbed the rank to still being named the first American president of the studio in 2007. Chrysler was the king of the minivan market. In 1990, the company controlled more than 95% of the domestic minivan market. Other companies tried for a piece of the pie, but the entrance into the segment, such as the Ford Aerostar, GM's trio of door stoppers couldn't pry so much of the finger from Chrysler's firm grip of the segment. Instead of falling in line, the 1991 Toyota Previa broke the mold. Its rounded styling and one-box architecture set it apart from the competition. It actually began as an interior layout study by a college designer. Engineers in Japan were curious enough to bring the study closer to reality. To preserve the spacious interior, they put the engine in between the front and the rear wheels and tilted it 75 degrees so it would fit under the driver's seat. Those that weren't aware of its mid and setup wouldn't know any better. The interior floor is completely flat with no protrusion to speak of. The midship layout all just helped to give it car-like handling. It distributed weight more evenly and lowered the car's overall center of gravity. This meant sharper cornering and smooth, predictable braking. The streamlined Coley design exterior had a coefficient of drag of just 0.33. For comparison's sake, the first generation Dodge Caravan had a CD of 0.42, and the second generation model that came out in 1981 had a CD of 0.39. Toyota's own Camry had a CD of 0.33, the massive greenhouse gave the driver spectacular visibility all around. 
the car garnered its fair share of accolades and even took home the Good Design Award. The New York Times even declared that it was at the head of its class upon release. The Previa was going to change everything. But it didn't. The Previa's ingenious engineering turned out to be its undoing. The layout improved driving dynamics, but it was always not on power because the larger engine couldn't fit in the car. The four-cylinder made 138 horsepower in its vanilla iteration. Toyota did rectify this in 1994, when they offered a turbocharged variant that bumped the number up to 158. Buyers in this segment would rather blend in than stand out, and the monospace capsule did nothing to divert curious glances. The final nail in the coffin was a surprise. In 1991, the Previa came in at a competitive $16,000. This blew it up to nearly $25,000 in 1997. The price increase can be attributed in large part to Japan's floundering economy. Its competitors were built in the US and therefore never had this issue. Toyota blinked. In 1997, it was replaced with a Sienna, a front-engine, front-wheel drive, Kentucky-built MPV that truly was the antithesis of the Previa. Over the years, it's garnered a bit of a cult following because of its unique powertrain, unusual styling, and countless quirks and features. The Toyota Sora was a personal luxury cube introduced in 1981. The first two iterations were only available in Japan, but the company decided to make the third generation model available for sale in the United States. Not as a Toyota, but as a Lexus. They could have made a two-door version of the Lexus LS400, though there was fear that such a conservatively stout car wouldn't have made much of an impression in that segment. They also considered selling a version of the current Sora, but in the end, they decided to create something from the ground up. Toyota handed the product off to Kalti in 1987, and they even shipped the Sora out of the studio for them to look at. When the designers drove the car around, no one to give them a second look. Well, almost no one. A few people asked why the steering wheel was on the wrong side. This was a disheartening experience, but they did pull one very important lesson from it. If they wanted to win the American market over, then conceptually, the new Sora needed to be a clean break from the previous two models. Kalti was a bit detached from Toyota's corporate structure, so they were able to experiment more with the development process. Katsushi Nosho, executive vice president of the studio, set up a secret Splendor studio in Laguna Beach in 1985. Here, the employees learned about sculpture and fine art. The car was designed entirely in three dimensions. Designer dropped plaster-filled balloons around their arms to create these sweeping organic forms. These were photographed and put on the projector. Well, the images were stretched and contorted until they found a shape that they wanted to move forward with. They jumped from here straight to scale modeling. Development was strictly hands-on ordeal. Throughout all of this, Colty was competing with two of its other studios for the winning proposal. There were two in Japan and another in Europe. They also had to show their car to chief engineer Toshihiro Okada. He came out to California several months earlier to see how the car was coming along. He didn't like the proposal they showed him, nor was he a fan of their unorthodox design methods. The team only leaned into their theme even more since then, and there was a real possibility that the higher-ups would pick something more restrained. Executives in Japan felt it was too much of a departure from the previous model, but once in the US, felt it was exactly what Lexus needed to solidify themselves in the American market. Engineer Seihachi Takahashi took a liking to it. He wanted to see the car reach production with as few changes as possible. In the end, they went with Kamalti's car, though this was only half the battle. The rounded shape of the car presented a bevy of technical issues. Core components of the corners of normally boxy hoods needed to be moved around to preserve the curved one on the car. The headlights in particular were a major sticking point. The ones on the original model integrated the low beams and the high beams into a single unit. Engineers couldn't fit all of the mechanicals into that surface. To preserve the hood, they ripped the high beams out of the main headlights and moved them inward. Designer Erwin Louis said it went from a two-eyed beauty to a four-eyed monster. It grew on him and became one of the car's defining features. Before becoming a car designer, Erwin Louis earned $165 an hour working as a valet. He sold the 1978 Celica during his shift. He didn't really take Javadier's car seriously, but he took a liking to it upon closer inspection. He later attended Art Center. Strother McMinn was his instructor, and his class went over the Celica's design process for a term. He was hired after graduating and has been with the company ever since. The car didn't reach production entirely intact. The original car had a smaller set of suicide doors to ease injury in the back seats. These never made it past the concept for a few reasons. They would have added a significant amount of weight to the car, compromised its structural integrity, and added even more time to development. Someone even turned Irwin that coupes didn't have four doors. How quaint. The first proposal also had clear taillights with a slight greenish tint. 
Irwin filled with an upscale touch, inspired by the kind of glass used in New York skyscrapers. The head engineer wondered why there was a green cover of red lights. He asked, doesn't red mean stop and green mean go? These were next here, but clear taillights would soon become one of the prevailing styling trends of the late 90s and early 2000s. Toyota themselves have a few iconic cars that supported them. Halsey is also responsible for one of the more memorable products born from the Retro Future craze of the early and mid 2000s. The F3 Cruiser, originally debuted as a concept car at the 2003 North American International Auto Show. The car was received so well at the show that it was greenlit shortly after. It entered production early 2006 mostly intact, though the design was tweaked a bit to get it production ready. The rearview mirrors on the show car were mounted directly in the A pillar, but the production car had them on the door. The concept also had chiseled, muscular wheel arches. They show up here as well, though they aren't as defined. You'd put your hand into the groove and pull up on the handle to open the door. It rolled out of the factory with more conventional ones shirt with the tundra of the day. The spirit of the car was still there despite the changes. It was hit right out the gates. Toyota moved over 50,000 cars in both 2006 and 2007. Sales took a hit in 2008 but they still managed to sell between 10 and 15,000 of them per year before it was discontinued in North America in 2014. You can still buy a new one if you live in the Philippines or the Middle East. The FTHS is a hybrid concept car. It was the result of a joint venture between Calty and Toyota's California-based Advanced Product Strategy Group. The name is short for Future Toyota Hybrid Sports. The design brief was, what is a suitable sports car for the 21st century? The FTHS is powered by a 3.5 liter V6, which, when combined with the hybrid system, puts out 400 horsepower. This is enough to propel the car from 0 to 60 miles an hour in just over 4 seconds. It runs in 21 inch carbon fiber wheels. The roof is one of the most intriguing design elements. It hovers over the rear glass to provide passengers with extra headroom. It dips inward at the center for aerodynamics. It's made from lightweight Kevlar and retracts into the rear seat space to provide an open-air experience. When asked what a price on the car was produced, Kevin Hunter said it would start at around $50,000. It was set to become the next Supra, but these plans were scrapped because of the recession. The basic design did eventually give way to the GT86 in 2012. The LFLC concept came about when Lexus challenged the studio to create a 2x2 luxury sports coupe that would further develop the brand's design language. The team didn't start sketching right away. Instead, they began with abstract shape research. Designers looked for sweeping organic forms that appeared in nature. They eventually settled on a large leaf to base their study on. The leaf was scanned into their computers and digitized. Then they began the process of blending this organic form with strong mechanical shapes. With the data gathered from the leaf, they were able to make a mold where other objects were pulled into it via a vacuum forming process. This was a great jumping off point. Sketching commenced after a steam was established for the project. Fluid precision design was emphasized the melding of nature and technology. Lexus had experimented with the spindle grill on the GS Sport Tadan and CT hatchback, but the LFL Sneak was the first of their cars to really commit to it. Everything either flows into or out of the front. The running lights, for example, are broken off from the main units and pushed into the nearest part of the grill. This tightened this area giving it a more sporty look while simultaneously making the top and bottom look imposing by comparison. The window ducks under the windshield pretty aggressively. This lowers the greenhouse and improves visibility a bit. The floating pillar, or a cantilevered pillar as they call it. The term comes from the architecture world. It describes a structure that is only supported on one side. The thinking here is that the roof appears to be held up by the A-pillar, allowing the C-pillar to float above the rest of the car. The lighting elements in the rear seem to go on and on. It's akin to the infinite realities that come about when setting two mirrors across from each other. Everything is tied together by another spindle form in the rear. The fluid precision continues into the interior. Wood and leather are used in conjunction with metal and high-tech interfaces to create an interesting contrast with shapes and materials. The infotainment system is of particular note. Call team intended for the driver to control everything with the touchpad nestled at the center console. They didn't even need to touch it. By simply hovering their hand over the pad, they'll get feedback that'll help them navigate the menus. If they have to type a name or address it, all they need to do is press the pad down. It'll tilt up toward the driver and turn into a touchscreen keyboard. 
and knocked showgoers in the motor and Preds theater of the 2012 Detroit Auto Show. It edged out the Chevrolet True 140S and Lincoln MKZ concepts to take home that year's Eisen Design Award. There were doubters in the industry that didn't think it would ever reach production. It was envisioned to occupy space under the $375,000 LFA. Even if it did see the light of day, it would either miss the mark and encroach on the aforementioned halo car or get watered down. It was a case similarly after a cruiser. Some of the magic was lost in the development process, though most of the finite elements made it through. The lines don't twist as heavily, and the grill doesn't stand out as much, but the detached DRL, ducked window, cantilevered C pillar, and spindle motifs at the front and rear all make an appearance. The spirit of the concept is still there. The final car we'll be taking a look at is a Toyota FT1 concept. It got off the ground when Kevin Hunter showed a few sketches to his boss, Tokuo Fukuichi. These were then presented to everyone's boss, Akio Toyota, to greenlit a proposal. This wouldn't be a production car, and more than likely wouldn't even grace the auto show floor as a concept car. He just wanted them to further develop the ideas shown in the drawings. The team still took it just as seriously as earlier projects. The LFLC concept had recently been given the production nod, and they felt that a lower cost Toyota version could be built upon the same architecture. The super name kept cropping up during these initial talks, and it's not hard to see why. It was their Halo car from its introduction in 1978 to its demise in 2002. It had all of the traditional sports car hallmarks, a long hood, a driver focused interior, and performance to match. The initial brief was, what if it was made today? Higher ups ultimately decided against using the name on the car. They thought it would hamper the creative process of designers and instead chose FT1. FT is short for future Toyota and one means ultimate. They went to Las Vegas Motor Speedway to have a look at their theoretical competition. They were just trying to see how other companies approach sports car design. There were plenty of drivetrain layouts, but they went with the tried and true front mid engine rear wheel drive configuration. After the trip, designers were to develop their own idea of what the ultimate Toyota sports car would look like. Kevin Hunter let his team have free reign for the most part, though he did have at least one rule. He wanted his car to be distinctly Toyota. In an interview with Auto Week, Hunter said, even though we were designing the car in America, there is some exoticness to being true to Japan's culture and who we are as a company. Everyone has their own identity. It's hard to put a new car into a place where people don't say, ooh, it looks like a Corvette or whatever. We didn't want to go off in a direction where we missed a target. We didn't want to rely on fashion. Six scale models were created, but the team couldn't come to a consensus. A larger model that combined touches of all of them were made as a compromise. This basic design was tied up and frozen. The time had come to show Akio Toyota what they had. They loaded up a container with two items, the model they spent months working on, and a high-tech gaming rig running Gran Turismo. Akio took the FT1 of the virtual lap around Fuji Speedway. This lap time in the simulation was faster than the one he had on an actual race car in the real world. The experience pushed the balance in Kulti's favor. He signed up on the show car that would debut in Detroit in January of 2014. Toyota collaborated with fabrication shop 5-Axis to construct a running prototype. Prior to this, 5-Axis built the final scion FRS show car. The design of the FT1 was chosen as the basis for a sports car jointly developed by Toyota and BMW. And would you know it, they called it the Supra. It's hard to imagine where Toyota would be without Kulti. Production models like the 1978 Celica in 1991, the Lexus SC400 helped firmly establish their respective brands in the United States, while the FT1 and LFLC are influencing the look of the cars as we speak. They put a flag on the West Coast and inspired a new, more expressive wave of automotive design. And it all began from a seed.